Well, you have me to thank for keeping you from happy hour for one more hour. Try to make it worth your while. It was a, just over 10 years ago that I came to Phillips Theological Seminary to interview for this position. And during that interview, I told a story that came out of my first experience of teaching in theological education at the Candler School of Theology at Emory. I was at the faculty meeting um, where it was announced that I had finally finished my dissertation and was due to graduate in May from Northwestern University and that at the end of or at the beginning of the next fiscal year I would be awarded with the title assistant professor. Well when that announcement was made there was applause all around as my colleagues congratulated me and then we had a break. Sometimes faculty meetings have breaks and so we went and had a break and during that time uh, a colleague of mine, um, Bill Everett, who was a new colleague, a new friend, came up to me and he says, well, Ward, what do you profess? Well, he must have seen that I had a perplexed look on my face, so he said, I know what you teach. You teach speech communication, but you're a professor. What do you profess? It's taken me 35 years to think about that question. So today, <laughs> wait for it. <laughs> and I hope that my profession that I offer will lend some insight that will allow the intersection of Jesus and justice to come more fully into view. And I say that with humility because I, I didn't grow up in a tradition that preached much about justice. In fact, I'd like to subtitle some of my remarks as being from preaching just Jesus to preaching a just Jesus. In my upbringing, the idea of justice was that you preach Jesus and lead someone to salvation, and then justice would take care of itself. So another thing I'd like to propose is that right in the middle of the words remind and renew, we add a third R, and that will put it right there in the middle and the third R is the word reframing. Remind, reframing, and renew. Because I think a lot of what we'll be doing over the next couple of days is reframing some images of Jesus and justice. I often spend the time during the holidays when the chance that I have to go home to South Carolina and with my mother and my sister recently, we have been, been doing some reframing of photographs and documents. And in the process, we sometimes see that the frames that we already have are not serviceable anymore. In fact, they're broken or the glue has come undone and the images or the photographs are slipping. And we find that in order to preserve what we know or to preserve what is precious to us, symbolized by those photographs, we have to take them out of the old frames and put them in new combinations or collages and perhaps allow for a larger frame to contain more images. So we've done that as a way of grieving together because of loss of something that w has been precious to us, a loss of a person to death, a loss of a, a former colleague or friend, that if we pull it out of the old frame or out of the old book that's weathering and falling apart and put it into a new frame, into a new combination of things, our experience of that relationship is renewed. 
And so I hope that we'll do a little bit of reminding, renewing, and reframing this week. It may be that you would like to do something like that yourself, that there are some things about your ministry, some images, some pictures that you retain. It may be that some frames around those have become fragile and perhaps need to be reframed in new combinations. When I was ordained into ministry at Candler, it was to teach speech communication, preaching, and storytelling. And at the time, homiletics was being reframed. It was being brought into new combinations with things like narrative theory, liturgical, uh, well, liturgical theory, liturgical arts, lit the uh, literature, rhetoric, communication studies, the arts, especially of storytelling. And by reframing homiletics in that way, when the, old homile the frame around the old homiletic had broken and maybe could become fragile, we were able to refresh our understanding of preaching and preaching that was meeting the needs of that particular time and place. It was responding, homiletics was responding to the pressure to make preaching more interesting. At a time when books were written by someone like Clyde Reed, who was my predecessor at Iliff, that was simply titled The Empty Pulpit. Preaching was supposed to now take up a different objective, a different purpose. It had to be an activity that brought the people that were coming into the church to worship, to bring them into a new relationship with God, and that the sermons would have to feature intersections between what the scripture and the tradition was with what they were experiencing in real life. That was the effort of the new homiletic. I laughed when that old quip that Harry Emerson Fosdick had about preaching, when it came rolling down the corridors of time and laid in my lap, that one that says, people don't come to church to find out what happened to the Jebusites. I, st I still don't think they do. So the new homiletic asked, what do they come to the church for? And the answer was, they come for an experience, an experience of the gospel, an experience of an encounter with God. Well, how does one bring about such an experience, they wondered. And they started advocating new methods, ways of attending to the orality of preaching, and that's where I came in. I was able to teach classes and give some talks about the importance of bringing biblical text to life through oral performance and oral interpretation. Thinking that if one were able to do that, if one were able to, to have that experience of Scripture as living human speech, then the task of preaching would be able to address another kind of experience of the gospel. In fact, there were times when people would say, you know, I never heard it that way before. We would taught how to, in our uh, uh, biblical interpretation not only what, not only to understand the text as a repository for theological ideas, but to understand how they worked as rhetoric, as communication. What was the artfulness? What was the literary artfulness of Scripture? How, did they, how were they able to communicate something like the person of Jesus, for example, by putting together the words in these particular narrative shapes, for example? We were taught to think of writing for the ear rather than for the eye and for the seminary classroom. Our theology professors, my colleagues, really loved that part but to write in clear descriptive language so that our students could see what we were saying, the people that we were preaching to could see and hear and come to grips with the claims that we were making. We were 
teaching in those days how to organize sermons into plots. Plots that move from some unsettling of the status quo, unearthing a conflict of perception, and move towards some kind of resolution. And the way that we spoke the resolution would hopefully bring about an experience of the gospel. We were taught and will teach that to write a manuscript, if a manuscript was necessary to bring the manuscript into the pulpit as a memory aid, not as the controlling dimension of the experience of preaching. And so through that time, there was new energy. It was as if the Holy Spirit was outpouring, and many women particularly, and young men, were finding their voices, finding their way to the pulpit, finding their own homiletical theologies to begin to take shape. It was as if the Spirit was pouring out on all flesh. Sons and daughters were prophesying. The old ones were seeing visions and writing about them, visions they had for a future church. And the young ones were dreaming great dreams of what the church could become. It was a heady time to be teaching, preaching, and to be brought into the academy that way. Well, that's been 30 years or so. And we all know that there have been different pressures on the activity of preaching I look back with nostalgia on the hopefulness that was in the academy at that time. We know about the pressures from resurgent fundamentalism that discounted these new ways of preaching, that ridiculed them. We know about right-wing extremism and how it's divided congregations. All of this being amplified by a digital technology that didn't exist when we were in our formative stage of learning how to preach. All of that seemed to crack the frame around the kinder, gentler preaching of the new homiletic. Tom Long has said in different places that about every 25 years or so, preaching suffers a nervous breakdown. and wondered, are we living through something like that now? The other thing that the new homiletic was vulnerable to was the criticism from activists and theologians that we weren't emphasizing enough issues of justice. We assumed that everyone would have their private experience of the gospel and go out and do the right thing. We were also preaching mostly, and I'm oversimplifying here, but there was a general tendency to focus on what the text was saying, to preach based on a text, not on what God was up to in the text, what God was doing in the world, and how to bring those two together. So what next? Clearly a robust response from the pulpit. But where is such a response going to begin? How is it going to be grounded? And I go back to the time when I was ordained, and Fred Craddock answered that question for me. The text was the, the, for the day was this. Jesus was traveling in the region between Samaria and Galilee on his way to Jerusalem. And he came into a village, and ten lepers called out to him, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They approached him, but kept their distance. And when Jesus saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priest. And they did. And they were cleansed. And then 
when one of them saw that he had been healed, turned around and came back and fell down at Jesus' feet. He was a Samaritan. And Jesus said, weren't ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Has no one come back to give thanks except this Samaritan? Very well. Get up, he said. Go your way. Your faith has made you well. That's a story from the Gospel of Luke. Ordination is an occasion where wounded healers present themselves to priests. And as Fred was keen to say in that sermon, don't forget to be the one to return to give thanks. For the altar is the oldest piece of furniture in the world. One thing I profess that the task of preaching Jesus and justice has to begin in prayer. Especially given the pressures as Alexis Carter Thomas has laid out for us this morning, this afternoon. We're feeling the pressure, I think, of rushing out to that intersection where we're going to do battle with the principalities and the powers of air that reign in our time. And boy, we're feeling their strength. And we're feeling that there needs to be an urgent word preached. Be reminded that the oldest piece of furniture in the world is an altar, a place for giving thanks, a place for asking for help. I suggest you pray something like this. It's adapted from a prayer that Rabbi Baal Shem Tov offered before every time he spoke. Holy One, I'm not the preacher you deserve. I don't know enough about your teachings or about the movement that you started. I'm not a hollow enough reed to let your gospel pass through me without getting entangled in my own limitations. But if these people don't hear about you through me today, then maybe they won't hear about you today at all. So I ask you, help me be big enough so that the gospel will pass through me in all of its power. Amen. So we rise up from giving thanks at the oldest piece of furniture in the world, and we make our way up to the piece of furniture that we preach from, be it a desk like this or a step or a mic stand or a pulpit, whatever they call it these days. What do we think we're doing when we preach? Before I think we can get to the question of Jesus and justice in preaching, we have to think again about what do we think we're doing now? From time to time, I'm privileged to sit with a group of working preachers who find themselves meeting together to discuss preaching and as an effort to keep their preaching ministries renewed. Sometimes they meet together to discuss the plans for Advent or Lent or developing preaching themes that they want to discuss with each other or perhaps sometimes it's the topic that, well, what are some what are some things from the storyteller's art that I might be able to incorporate in my preaching? And sometimes it's something even more basic, like what's going on in the field of homiletics that I'm not aware of? What are some models of preaching I should be exploring? What are some images that might guide me in the development of my own sermons? Now, I could tell them, like, Tom Long, that we are in the midst of a nervous breakdown, or I could put a different frame around that and say, I think that it's Pentecost in the academy, 
no matter what the liturgical calendar says. This is how the Holy Spirit is working to meet one of the challenges of postmodern culture by calling different voices into the preaching task. It's as if, I think, there's a reenactment of that scene in Acts, but this time with new lines and a new cast. There's whispering in the community. Are not these who are speaking to us preachers? Then how is it that each of us is hearing the gospel in a way that makes sense to us? For we are male, we are female, we're non-binary, we are moderates, we're liberals, we're conservatives, and independents, we are gay, straight, queer. Each of us is hearing of the mighty acts of God in our own language, in ways that we can understand. Shameless plug for the United Church of Christ now, God is still speaking. And God is doing so through a richly divorced core of servants of the word, which has been my privilege to serve, to serve the servants of the word for these years. And I say, if all kinds of people are being called to the task of preaching, can the renewal of the church be far behind? In the book of Acts, and in the four Gospels, we see the beginnings of how preaching began to diversify from a small cadre of followers to become a worldwide at that time movement. It must have been the case that those early proclaimers would have to ask something like, what do we think we're doing? What are we doing when we preach? How do we go about it? And in John's Gospel, there is an account of some Greeks, it says, who approach one of those proclaimers named Philip with a request. Sir, we would see Jesus. And we don't hear Philip saying, well, what do you want to see him for? The Gospel doesn't tell us. Nothing like that between the lines. Do they want to see Jesus, the miracle worker who raised Lazarus? Do they, as Greeks, respect Jesus' oratorical skills? Or do they just have some questions to ask? Where do you come from? Is all over the Gospel of Mark. John, excuse me, Warren. We don't know. And John's Gospel, as frustrating it is, frustrates us once again when it says that Philip's take, Philip takes the Greeks were crest to Andrew, and the two of them go to Jesus, and Jesus gives a speech about the cross and the cost of discipleship. And you can just see the Greeks moving away. We don't know what happened to them, but I know one thing that happened to their request. If you would go around in the churches of my childhood, you would see there on a small plaque tacked along the bottom edge of the pulpit, right where the Bible was open, and there'd be notes or manuscript. Certainly, the plaque would catch the preacher's eye with these words. Sir, we would see Jesus. It's certainly unfortunate that the one standing there was assumed to be a sir, but plain enough to send the spirit shiver down the spine of any preacher, I think. Is that what I'm supposed to do when I preach? Is enable people to see Jesus? How do you do that? How do you preach a person? Well, it's harder than you think. I have a confession to make. I've got a story kind of like President Pittman's earlier. I I was traveling. I didn't go. I didn't do what she. I, well, you'll hear about it. I was traveling on the plane, going to see my family in South Carolina. I forgot that I was carrying a book on preaching with me. It's a book by Chuck Campbell of the Duke Divinity School. It's a title that goes right to the heart of what I'm talking about. The title screams 
preaching Jesus. Can't avoid it. And I had it out there on the tray in front of me on the plane. It was a full flight. I was in the window seat. A nice couple came to sit beside me. And to my horror, their eyes looked over to the book. And I had a flashback. I remember that I was on a plane flying from Atlanta to Birmingham, and the only seat that was left was by an individual who was sitting in the window seat, and on his lap was the title, How to Win a Soul for Christ. Fortunately, he was asleep. <laughs> and fortunately for me, it was a short flight. But I thought for a moment, oh my gosh, and you should have seen how fast I covered up preaching Jesus and put it in my bag, laid back, and pretended to take a nap. Now, what was that about? Was it the fact that I just didn't want to get into it and risk what President Pittman had to go through? It's already difficult when you get that vacant stare when they say, what do you do? Uh, I teach preaching and worship at a liberal theological school in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> Silence is golden. <laughs> was it something like that? Or was it my turn to play the part of Simon Peter in the Passion Story? Where I say, I tell you, I don't know the man. When the Greeks in our day come to us with the request, we would see Jesus. What are you going to say? Sometimes you might get called out. Once I took a group of students from Yale Divinity School, we had an immersion class, into Appalachia. And I, uh, I wanted our highly literate, highly educated, manuscript-dependent preachers to be exposed and participate in services where the preachers were preaching in a radically different way. The kind that you might remember where the spirit-filled chanting folk preacher takes over the pulpit and there's a new thing created. I wanted them to see something about, you know, technique. Uh, what about spontaneity, being available to the Spirit, being ready to speak if called upon without having time to prepare? I thought we could learn something about that. Well, we learned something quite different. Part of our uh, immersion experience was to go and visit some of the churches that were in the region, and we went to one church that uh, we saw from the a sign uh, outside, a, a hand-painted sign that said Gospel Holiness Church. And so we made our way inside. They knew we were coming. There were about as many of us as there were of the members, I guess, uh, the participants. Uh, the music had already started. It was uh, guitars and drums and stomping on the, on the floor and hands raised and clapping. And there we were from Yale. The one, the leader of the church uh, was a tall woman who, who they called Mother. She was a, a majestic figure, I would say. And after a certain amount of time of the singing and the testifying and the chanting and the spirit, Mother made her way over to us. She... Um, put her hand on my arm and said in a gentle voice, now, which one of you would like to tell us what Jesus means to you? Boy, you should have look, seen the look of panic on those. Those talkative divinity school students had nothing to say. They looked to me to tap into my inner Baptist and rescue them. But I didn't have to, because at a critical moment, 
Rosemary Bowie stood. Rosemary was about 70. She had been trained as an opera singer and was now a candidate for ordination and one of our students at Yale in the Master of Divinity program. She walked up to the piano and sat down and began to play. And for just that moment, we were in Carnegie Hall, and she sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And soon, people of all kinds of ages and economic status, the poor, perhaps addicted to alcohol, people that didn't have much in the way of this world, were standing with these affluent students from Yale and holding hands and saying, Jesus loves us, this we know. I tell you, if you think that that little song has lost its power, you haven't seen it sung by the right person in the right place by the right people. We would see Jesus. Well, that was the message I got about preaching in the early formative days. And I believe that I was honest with that. I came by it honestly. We had a, in our church, we had an outreach to some Korean army officers. Uh, people would come to Fort Lee, which was a fort right outside of Colonial Heights in Petersburg, Virginia. They'd come from all over the world, but mainly the ones we got to know were uh, men from Korea, South Korea, uh, uh, Korea uh, Japan, and in ca some cases, Taiwan. They would come as a group. They would travel together because they were all away from their families, and they kind of brought their own community, and we offered to bring them to church. And they accepted, and they came, and there was one particular group of South Koreans that came and really bonded with our church. They took places in the choir. They made up the tenor and bass section. And boy those Wednesday night suppers sure improved. Well, the time came for them to go back to South Korea, and in their farewells, they were saying, now you're going to have a gift that's going to come your way. It will be delivered long after we're gone, but there's a gift that's coming that we want to give you to give the church. Boy, it was like Christmas. Christmas. All over again, there was Christmas. We were waiting. What kind of gift would that be? We imagined things. Oh, what, would, what, what could they possibly send? So the days passed. The impatience grew. Finally, the word was out. The Korean gift is here. It's in the vestibule of the church. I couldn't wait to see it. I was all of about 12 years old, running over, seeing, looking at it, and boy, was I disappointed. It was just a portrait of Jesus. It was just not even a new angle on it. It was just the version I'd seen in a thousand homes and Sunday school rooms. There he was, the good shepherd with the little lambs, supplied by heaven's prop department. It wasn't even in black and white, but a sort of gray, vague gray. It was a ghostly Jesus, a scary Jesus, a haunting Jesus. A, it wasn't even a Jesus. It was a kind of sketch of Jesus. Ho-hum. Well, one of the deacons of the church, a man with the wonderful name of Mr. Bone. You can see him, can't you, Mr. Bone? Yeah. He must have seen my fit of peak. Well, it was like getting socks and underwear for your birthday. He said, come back, come back, take a closer look. Come here, come here, son, come on, come on. Isn't that the way that mentors in faith are? Maybe people in our church, they say, come back for a closer look. Look what you didn't see the first time. How could I say no to Deacon Bone? I took a closer look, and there I saw what I hadn't seen before. 
the words of the entire text of the New Testament had been shaded in such a way that the figure of Jesus emerged. You couldn't really get what was going on if you stood too close to it because then you'd just see words. But if you step back, you could see that the words revealed an image. Word and image together in the frame. Image made of words. It was a lesson I learned, a lifelong lesson that I learned in preaching. The words that we use, if they're chosen correctly and properly and for the ear and sound like everyday speech, can reveal images that people remember. Just Jesus. In Appalachia, in the church of my youth, that was all. Je just Jesus was enough. The evangelist would come through. I, being an aspirant preacher, would ask, what should I preach about? And they'd say, just tell people what Jesus means to you. That seems to be the recommendation of a particular school of thought in homiletics. We call it a post-liberal approach, in case you're taking notes. That book I mentioned, Preaching Jesus by Chuck Campbell, he's one of the leading proponents of this particular approach to preaching. He was critical of others in the new homiletic by saying things like this, too many so-called narrative preachers would rather tell a story from their own experience where Jesus is a character rather than tell a Jesus story where the preacher is the character. Campbell and others in that school believed that homiletics had been too focused on method, that is, how to preach, and needed to be focused on more who we preach. Make sure, they say, that the figure that emerges from the words of your sermon is not your own personality, but the figure of Jesus the Christ, and make the call to discipleship very clear. The post-liberal preacher says, preachers should be forming a people around the stories of Jesus, not telling a different story that is relevant to the people. In the background of that approach is an encounter at Yale Divinity School in a previous generation or two between Paul Menier and Rudolf Bultmann. Menier says, Bultmann, your concern is that we demythologize the New Testament. My concern is that we allow the New Testament to demythologize us. Now, back to the interview 10 years ago. There was that moment when I had to make a presentation to the faculty. And I made a confession to them that startled them. I was asked after my presentation, imagine this, what theologians do you read? Well, I wasn't interviewing for a theology position. We already had that covered. Joe Vessler and Sarah Maurice Brubaker were in place and doing a fine job. And it wasn't one of them that asked the question. I'll leave it up to your imagination to who it might have been. Well, it was an unfair question. I don't know, but I gave it my best shot. I said, well, you know, I'm kinda, I kind of like the post-liberals at Yale. You know, like Hans Frey and George Lindbeck? Well, you could have heard a pin drop. Or maybe it was a curse in the back. Or maybe it was a quiet moan. Or maybe it was the sound of jaws dropping. The sound of my candidacy running off the rails. Let's just say there was a big reaction. Well, I've had 10 years to think about it, and what I was trying to say was I appreciated the way that the post-liberals trusted the Jesus stories to awaken interest in Jesus. That had been borne out in my own experience of telling these gospel stories. Sometimes when I would tell it within the church, people would say, yeah, well, yeah, I, did, I never heard it that way before. But when I'd tell them outside the church, and in a group, for example, of young men and women who wanted to become insiders into the corporate world, Told it without commentary, told the, told the prodigal son story. Told it without commentary, no introduction, using the words of the gospel in English, of course, 
there was time for response, and one young woman in the group said, that was a great story. Did you write it? When I explained that where the stories came from, there was genuine interest that came from the Bible. So I was trying to explain what the basis of my practice of biblical storytelling was. Now, I know there are many ways, as Barbara McBride Smith, widow of beloved Professor Dennis Smith, professional storyteller and sometime teacher of storytelling here that many of you might have had, she would have been the first of speaking of a wide range of bringing the biblical stories to life. But the one I practice goes like this. This comes from the website. We strive to tell the story without fear, believing that Christ calls his followers to influence both individuals and the culture in which they live. We believe that the sacred stories of the biblical tradition have the power to transform the lives of both teller and hearer. Could have been straight out of an introduction to post-liberal theology. But what I have experienced in my practice is that this way of presenting, performing a biblical text can transform a person's perception of that text. A different set of questions rise. And it was biblical storytelling that took me more deeply into the study of preaching. Because biblical storytelling or the effective oral reading of Scripture in worship can raise questions that perhaps the preacher can address. So as a biblical storyteller, if I was to get the, the statement, we would see Jesus like this, I would say, let me tell you a story like this one. Jesus came into the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he didn't want any, he went into a house he didn't want anyone to know. But he could not be hidden. And immediately a woman, when she heard of him, came. A woman whose daughter was caught by an unclean spirit. She came and fell at Jesus' feet. The woman was a Greek a Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. Jesus said, let the children be fed first. It's not right to take children's bread and throw it to dogs. She said, yes, sir but even dogs under the table will eat the children's crumbs. So Jesus said, for saying that, you may go. The evil spirit has left your daughter. As she returned, she found her daughter lying in bed. The demon was gone. Now, why do I tell that story? Well, if preaching is about seeing Jesus, then what is the Jesus we see in this story? Is this the Jesus we want to preach? A Jesus that refuses the request of a desperate woman just because she's a member of an enemy nation? Is this a Jesus that we want to preach in a context where a resurgence of foreigners, of hostility to foreigners is all too present in our culture? For healing for children who have come from forms of possession and evil possession and spirit such as that in, from gangs of the countries of origin who are fleeing from unemployment, hunger, who only ask for the freedom to work, that plague the, the evil spirits that plague them in so many ways 
Does the church want to preach a Jesus that gives voice to a political agenda that will withhold even the crumbs from the table in order to discourage further immigration? Well, that's not why I'm telling the story today. I'm telling it because I want to make a couple of points here at the end. The preacher needs the art of the biblical storyteller or the skillful lector or the skillful reader of a text to bring a text about Jesus to life through oral performance, through oral interpretation, through storytelling, so that that Jesus in the text can come through more vividly. But the biblical storyteller and the interpreter of the text needs the preacher to bring the figure of Jesus into the world we inhabit the world of the listener. And this is where I part company from the post-liberals. By all means, begin with an oral interpretation that helps us see Jesus more vividly in the text. But preacher, help us see God's gospel come to life in our world so vividly that we want to perform that gospel in this world. I see, I tell this story too because I see something related to our theme. I believe if you put another frame around this story, we can see an intersection where Jesus and justice meet, not amicably, more like where Jesus and justice collide. Justice arrives in the story as an unseen but powerful presence to resolve the tensions between the characters and bring the three of them, the daughter, the Syrophoenician woman, and Jesus into right relationship with God. Justice is worked out in the interaction of Jesus and the woman. It does not simply descend from on high. You see, the force of the woman's desperate request moves Jesus out of the center, allowing justice to emerge. Perhaps in those moments between the time that the woman says, Sir, even the dogs under the table will eat the children's crumbs, and the moment where Jesus says, For saying this, you may go your way, your daughter is free from that spirit. How long do you think that pause was? How long did it take for justice to break down the barrier that was separating them? This is the Jesus that we want to preach. The one that is just as responsive to a cry for justice as he is able to let it flow through him like rushing water. So with that, let me return to the image earlier of Jesus in the vestibule and do a bit of reframing. For all I know, the frame around that piece of art, that piece of calligraphy, so skillfully done, for all I know, the frame around that is broken. For all I know, it may not even be there anymore, hanging in that place in the church of my youth. And I'm sh certainly not sure how many of those who were there that day, the day that that was unveiled to our congregation, are still with us in this life. It's up to me to put a new frame around it if I'm going to carry that with me and the lessons I learned. As I look back in my mind's eye, I see it differently in a way that is instructive to me now. The figure of Jesus, as I recall, was kind of gauzy. It seemed to float out of the words of the New Testament. It was not grounded, not incarnate. It needed color. It needed more texture. It needed to be filled in. That's the kind of work a preacher does to provide through language filling in the picture of Jesus at all the intersections that Jesus came to, using language that real people use when they talk to each other.
See, we don't preach just Jesus vaguely floating above some text. We preach a just Jesus. Standing arm in arm at an intersection with justice at an intersection that he calls home. 